right. One second here. Oh, well, that's amazing. Is there one down there? There we go. Yes, I am. That's a good one. Perfect, thanks. Yeah, that we, we were talking about that. I, I told Andrew, I said, man, I kind of feel like a church planner now. I'm le- like, I'm part of worship, not leading, I'm part of worship and I'm doing the sermon. And he said, well, one thing I know is that one of those always suffered. And I said, well, now I'm twice as nervous. So, <clears throat> but uh, no, it was just a sweet time of worship. Just amazing. It's almost like, let's just go home and be there. But, but it also makes me wonder, well, if that was so good, then maybe this was the part that suffered. I don't know. Anyway, <clears throat> but uh, good, to, good to be here with you. Um, as we all say, it's, a, it's definitely an honor, a privilege um, to share with you today. Um, Frank, it is so flipping good to see you. We've, um, my heart just burst when you walk through the door, man. I, we've just been praying for you and just so, so glad to see you here, man. It's awesome. So, um, speaking of heart exploding, like I'm just, there's this stuff that's just bubbling up in, in me and I've, I feel like I'm going to turn into Chris in a second, like just so passionate, like ready to go. It's like, let's go. Uh, <clears throat> no, I, we were at the Equip this week, the, the Denver Equip, Regional Equip, and uh, I, I just want to encourage you, if you did not get a chance to make it this time, it's okay, you know, there's no judgment, but come to the next one. Like, it was an amazing time of just gathering with fellow believers, fellow, fellow ministers, um, you know, and all of it was really around this whole thing of partnership in the gospel. I mean, just everything that was being said was just resonating, and my, my heart was just like, yes, yes, and, you know, I, I, I felt like... Um, Oh, uh, the, 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 an elf, you know, like the little guy that's got all of his awesome stories, you know, just like, yes, I felt like that guy for a minute. Anyway, just exploding with, with just passion for the gospel, and, um, but I just want to encourage you to, to join that the next time you can, whether it's in Denver, maybe if you're fortunate enough to go to Chicago, LA, wherever it's going to be next, um, and of course there's the world equipped, but even just the regional ones, come, if you can, if you can spare a day off work, come, I, I got to tell you, I, I took the day off Friday, and I just there's no regrets absolutely whatsoever. Like, it was just so good. So um, we, we all know we have schedules and things, but if you can, you know, come next time. It's great. So that's my plug. Um, fired up. All right. Uh, but really, it, it was around this thing of partnership in the gospel. And, and again, just reminded, uh, as we've read multiple times, Philippians 1, 3 through 6, I thank my God every time I remember you in every prayer for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on into completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And uh, again, we were, we're coming together and some of the themes that we talked about at the Equip, you know, we talked about spiritual momentum, uh, gaining even here in Colorado, you know, because of COVID, people are just willing. They're just willing to talk. They're willing to share. They're willing to find some alternatives to the things that are not working. And we have the ultimate, the ultimate solution. And people are open and they're willing to, to lend an ear where they haven't before. We also talked about remembering the goodness of God, the mighty acts of God, carrying on in our call. And we're going to touch on that, but, but also finishing the race. And, and, and that's, that's our partnership in the gospel. We're spurring each other on. We're saying, run the race, finish, finish strong. You know, I, I tell my kids when they play sports, give full effort. And I know they, they hate hearing this, but I'm just like, no matter what you do in word or deed, sports, school, whatever, full effort. Give it all. Finish strong. We're almost there. There's two weeks to go. Finish strong. And uh, that's, <laughs> so I'm telling you, I'm turning into Chris. <clears throat> But, you know, Philippians 3, 13, 14, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal, the prize of the upper call in Christ Jesus. We're pressing on. 
And we have this partnership together. And uh, it's not just the preacher's job. We've talked about this before. It's not just the preacher's job. It's not the worship leader's job. We're all ministers. Every one of you. You and you and you and you and you and you and you. We're all ministers. And we're doing this together. It's, it's our job to get the gospel out together. And so our partnership, while we've had this, um, this great series, and I think, we, I think we've come to an understanding of what this is, uh, of what it means to have a partnership But now it's not just the understanding. To me, it's the actual doing. It's doing it, doing the gospel. James 1.22. I've got different versions here, and I'm going to read them. But it says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are fooling yourselves. So we can have this conceptual buy-in to the partnership of the gospel, but if we're not taking action and doing something, we're fooling ourselves. So it's like, now what? You know, we go through this, and, and I, I'm asking myself this, que- myself this question. It's like, okay, I get it. Conceptually, I'm in. Right? We're at the quip all together. We've been talking about it. It's great. I used to be a marketing director like a while back, and uh, we had copywriters. And uh, what all that means is just people that know how to write words properly. Uh, they have decent English skills or grammar skills. And they talk about, they write about the products or services that you're selling, right? And so <clears throat> at the very end, and this is how you can see if, it, if there's a good marketing person and when you watch things or, or when you read things, there's always a call to action. So sometimes someone would give me some marketing copy and I'd read through it and I'd say, okay, that's great. That widget does this and that thing does that. What do you want me to do now? Like, we got to tell people, click here and buy now. We got to tell people, sign up, get on the list, and we're going to get you the next step. Or here's the process and here's how we go. The call to action. So I'm just like, now what? And so we understand this. So what's the call to action? Well, it's a call to action. Like, I can't specifically tell you what you're going to do, but it's time to have some action. And so for me personally, and and what I'm trying to say here is, it's time to get to work. And for some of you, it's time to get back to work. It's time to stop delaying. Time to stop running from God. Time to start running the race again. Like, get back in the race. Find that lane again. And press on. I'm just so stirred more than ever. It's, it's, it's time for all of us. And like I said, I can't tell you your specific action, your specific lane. God's going to help you find that. Some of you already know. But what I can say, it's time for action. So uh, growing up, um, I grew up in Oklahoma. So I wouldn't wish Oklahoma on anybody, but, <clears throat> but I, still, I still claim the Sooners. So that's my team, Boomer Sooner, uh, for life. Uh, no, I grew up in Oklahoma as a kid, and my dad be- got a pastoral position here in Denver when I was about 12 or 13, we moved here. Um, but I remember we'd go to visit uh, our pastors, uh, Brother and, brother and sister Callahan. This was back in the 80s, right? Pentecostal church, brother and sister. And so great uh, men of God. Sister Callahan actually, uh, she's probably in her early 90s. She's, she's still around. Um, pretty amazing. But I remember we visited them. I was a kid. I was eight years old. And she said to me, we were talking. She said, hey, Timmy. I don't, my name's Tim, all right? It's not Timmy, it's not Timmy, it's not any of that stuff. <laughs> I remember my, uh, my, my mom came to my elementary school and she had my lunch because she forgot to get it. And she comes up to the, you know, the fence, you're outside playing in the, in the playground. She comes up to the fence, she's like, do you guys know Timmy Heil? And I'm just like, oh my gosh. I go up and grab my bag. It's Tim, mom, thank you. Anyway, back to the story. She says, Timmy, 
I was like eight. She says, what are you, what are you doing for Jesus? I don't even know what I said. I'm sure I said, well, you know, I'm telling my friends at school, stuff like that. But what I can tell you is that thing has stuck with me to this day. What are you doing for Jesus? What are you doing with Jesus? What are you doing in this partnership in the gospel? It is not time for us to sit around, do our nine to five thing, and just call it good. We all have to work, make a living, all that, and... There's, there's uh, something great about a business that's intentional. I think of um, the Birches and, and Andrew, some of the just amazing stories coming out of their businesses, but that's not what we're called to, right? We, we work to live, that's great, but there's so much more. What are you doing for Jesus? We have the hope. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only solution to our world. There's so many, millions of people that don't know Jesus. People are sick and dying. Millions of prodigals running from Jesus. So what are we doing for Jesus? What are we doing with this partnership with Jesus? <clears throat> Again, it's not just the preacher. It's not the worship leader. Sundays are great. This is awesome. We were having a brainstorm as an eldership team, and we talked about some of the things that we do on a Sunday. You know, we create a culture of worship, we invite people to his presence, we build community, we celebrate what God's done, we get an opportunity to hear his voice, like we did this morning, which was amazing, flowing in the gifts, and we create an atmosphere to help people come to know Jesus. You know, but primarily, mainly, this is a gathering for believers. This is a, we come together, we celebrate the goodness of God, and we encourage one another to go out, outside the walls, and do something for Jesus. So what has God called you to do, but you're waiting? What has God approached you to do, but you're praying about it? I grew up in ministry, right? I, I know. I know when I say, hey, can you help with the setup? And they say, let me pray about that. I'm like... All right, I've got a couple of different lists, and your name is on one of them. <clears throat> I, I, I can read through that stuff, all right? But what, what, seriously, though, what, what's, what's God calling you to? You're praying about it still. What's God called you to do individually, as a family? Again, at the Equip, I, I just love this one piece. Again, all of it was great. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Ron Larson that was there, and he, he touched on calling and on finishing the race he says, a calling is an urgent appeal from God. He's urgently appealing to you. He's inviting you to accept the responsibility of a task. And he's inviting you to walk in a new intimacy with him. And I think that intimacy comes because usually the task at hand is greater than what you can do. And so it's kind of making you have some faith and relying on God more. And therefore, a new intimacy is happening. It's an urgent appeal. Some of you know your calling, some of you are still searching, but one thing's for certain, we're all called to be ministers, ministers of the gospel. And I'm talking Ellie at six, JJ at 18, Jack and Lorna at 84, whatever, youngest to oldest, we're all called to be ministers of the gospel. And if you're not sure yet what it is, my plea to you is... Start serving. Start serving in the local church. There's something about serving where you, again, you get this intimacy with God and you start, he starts to speak to you and you start to realize what your unique giftings and callings are. Then you can take it from there and go out. Yeah. I love, um, let's see, Jordan and, and the Beatty girls are in Chicago at the worship thing, which is sweet. Pray for them. But when jo Jordan spoke... Uh, a couple weeks ago, I just love this phrase. It stuck with me. Let your yeses be limitless. Your yeses be limitless. You know, as much as possible, I try to say yes to, to whatever open doors there are. You know, um, you know, sometimes I get nervous. Sometimes TK asks me to preach, and, and honestly, I, I get nervous, but I say yes. Because God's opened the door, 
it's going to stretch me. Therefore, I'm going to have to rely on him more. Therefore, a new intimacy comes, you know. But I try to say yes. It's reminded of the Philippians 2, you know, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Again, my name's not Timmy, but Timothy. <clears throat> but actually, Timothy, me, my dad drilled this into me. He's like, your name means one who honors God, and that's who you are. And so Timothy is one who honors God, and, and it's not just, I'm not bragging on my name or anything. It's just I'm reminded, as he's talking about him in Philippians, I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you will know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he served with me in the work of the gospel. As a son with his father. This is generational. Sons and daughters and their sons and daughters and their sons and daughters. Serving in the partnership of the gospel, the work of the gospel. Are we teaching our families to serve? Are we teaching our kids to serve? Let me say this about calling uh, young people. Your calling doesn't have to look like your parents' calling. I just, again, my dad was a, a pastor. I had people come up to me. Hey, Timmy, you're going to be a, I'll just, I'll just use that. I'll take it. I'll own it. I'll own it. I put it out there. I'll own it. <clears throat> You're going to be a pastor like your dad. And honestly, I was like, no. And people, what? Because I, I just knew there was something different coming. And some of you that know me know I do some things differently. But um, <clears throat> what, just with music and other things. But my dad was always supportive of that. And I say that to my kids and, and you young people. You're calling. If your parents are serving the Lord, it doesn't have to look like your parents. You have your own unique gifting, your own unique calling, and God's going to steer you in the direction you need to go. But serving is generational. So sons and, sons and daughters and their sons and daughters and their sons and daughters because of the bigness of the call that we're in. Philippians 2.14, do everything without grumbling or complaining so that you may be blameless and pure children of God in a warped and crooked generation, then you will shine among them like stars. Who wants to shine like a star in this dark world? So what are we saying yes to? Now again, it comes down to priorities, but what are we saying yes to? What I need to know is what time is it? Anyway, I lost my time. That's all right. Think of the story of Jonah, you know? He had an opportunity to say yes. We all know the story. God called Jonah to Nineveh. God called him. God gave him an urgent appeal to preach to Nineveh. The urgent appeal was to help them see their wicked ways and depart from their wicked ways. He called him to do that. But Jonah chose to go to Tarshish, Tarshish. What's interesting is Nineveh was, according to the historians and all that, and, and the uh, I guess topographers or map makers or whatever, Nineveh was about 500 miles this way, and he chose to run to Tarshish, which was 2,500 miles in the opposite direction. Tarshish, according to experts, was linked to silver, gold, uh, it was a port city, so the, tr the, the ships were like treasure ships to some degree, filled with expensive cargo. So in some sense, it was a symbol of wealth and power and kind of the easy life, right? And I'm sure, um, I'm sure perhaps Jonah even tried to justify it. Well, while I'm there, I'll do some good things. I'm, I'll tell people about Jesus, but he wasn't called there. And let me tell you, when you have a, a calling somewhere, there's always going to be that other boat down another path Coming, coming its way to, to pull you from the things of God. <clears throat> Nineveh was sinful. It needed to repent. I was kind of blown away by some of this stuff. It was the capital city of Assyria, which was a barbaric community. Uh, Israel was Assyria's greatest enemy. Assyria was known to wipe out cities and make pyramids out of the heads of the men that they slaughtered. 
That's the kind of city he was called to that God was giving an urgent plea to go minister. And our, my question is, are we willing to go there? And Nineveh is now known as what we call modern-day Iraq. So I'm pretty sure Jonah thought he was going to die. He didn't like that mission. But he was called to go and serve his enemies. So God might call you to do something you don't like. Side note, it might even be in the church. You know, we should have a wait list for people serving in the church. We should. We should have a wait list. Again, because we're, we're creating opportunities for people to encounter God. But we, we don't like that, so we tell people like me, I'll pray about it. All right? But are you waiting to get a word from God that you like? Has God called you somewhere, but you're just nervous? But you're waiting? Are you waiting to get a call from God that you just like? It's almost like you're waiting for your mom to count to three, right? Timmy, get over here. Actually, if I was in trouble, it'd be my full name. Timothy Bruce Heil. You've got to the count of three. One, two, two and a quarter, two and a half. Look, God's not on two and three quarters, all right? He called you. He calls you, you do it. Again, another statement from my parents. We all, I think a lot of us know, delayed obedience is disobedience. So what's God called you to, whether you like it or not? And I think we all have stories where, you know, we step into things that you're unsure of or maybe you don't like, but maybe it's just a lot of you're just unsure of. But through that, God brings you through and he ends up bringing you into something that was even greater than what you could ever imagine because his ways are so much higher than our ways. He sees the end game. <clears throat> but you're, you know, your calling is not for your glory. It's for God's glory. It's, it's not about making you shine. It's about making him shine. You think of like a football team, you know, and I think the, the player I have most sympathy for are like the tight ends. And it's not because I like Tim Tebow, all right? <laughs> Timmy! <laughs> Timmy, he's, he's honoring God on the football field, right? That's what his name means. No, but tight ends, they're crazy athletic. They can catch the pass. They can score the touchdown. But you know what? They got to block a lot. And... They have to understand it's not about you. It's so that in our partnership, we can get to the end zone. So you do your role. But at some point, you're going to block, you're going to spin off, and we're going to throw it to you. But you do your part. And so sometimes God calls you to catch the ball. Sometimes God calls you to block and plow and do other things. I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> What's that? <laughs> Just in the story of Jonah, we all know what ends up happening and <clears throat> said he repents, but, you know, I imagine he was scared, you know? And uh, we need to start choosing faith over fear. Faith and obedience please God. It clearly says that. Hebrews eleven six. 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. God wants you to choose faith over fear. We need people who see with eyes of faith. And that's what's amazing. I, we, we've heard some of the stories. We have these miracle babies lined up right here. We got miracle Frank right here. We, <clears throat> lots of stories of healing and stuff. You know, we had... We had a little, I'll share this because I told them I would. We had this small story, this small miracle, um, but it's huge. It's huge to some people, but it stirs faith. All right, so night of the equip. So, so it's Friday, Friday night, we get home, and normally when I'm hanging out on the couch, <clears throat> we have this hamster, and I'm not like, I'm not a fan of animals. 
But for some reason, over the last six months, we've become a flipping petting zoo at my house. <clears throat> we got hamsters, we got cats, we got chickens. I'm just expecting a cow just to come through and goats and all this other stuff. All right, but we have ham we've had hamsters, we've had a few hamsters. We've had a few hamsters. Anyway, this one came, and normally about 10 o'clock, he's, he's in his cage, and it's just, and it's just, ah, oh, this thing's so annoying. I hate this thing. <clears throat> so anyway, Lorna and, I, Lorna and Gail and I were sitting down, and, and we're like, it's kind of quiet. What the heck's going on? So Lorna goes over, and she's digging for it, can't find it. It's like, I don't know. Did he get out or? So we tell my wife, Lorna, and she's like, oh, no. So she crawls, she's like, I see him. And this thing is, like, skinny and cold and, like, again, normally at this time, it's just like, shoo, 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 shoo. And he's just, like, I mean, barely moving, and his eyes are closed. And so I'm like, I, I think this thing's going to die. So I don't know what happened. Did we forget to feed it? Did we... I mean, I don't feed any of this stuff, so this is on you. <clears throat> I don't want it. Good riddance. I'm about to be blessed. <laughs> and, but she, and I'm just like, wow. And so I go upstairs and grab something, and I just hear this, what? Oh, my gosh. I go down there, and these guys are the eyewitnesses. This, Lorna had them in his hand, and this thing was and they, they don't lay down on their back and just stay there. They're moving. This thing was dead. So Lorna, by faith, I think it was out of, you know, when Jesus did something, it said he had compassion on them, right? And I think Lorna had, I think Lorna had compassion on Kylie because she didn't want her to come home and see her hamster gone, you know? And even when we tried to tell her the story, she's like, oh, what happened, you know? <clears throat> And, but Lorna had compassion. She was thinking about Kylie, and she just started praying. And she said, no, in the name of Jesus, you're going to rise up, and you're going to be healed. <laughs> and this thing went. <laughs> and it started moving around. It started moving around. And they were like, whoa, oh, my gosh. And it started eating. And last night... We're, we're laying down, and the lights are off, and we hear this. <laughs> she starts laughing. I smile, but I'm just like, ugh. <laughs> she robbed me of a blessing. <laughs> but, <clears throat> okay, but faith. Faith. That's a story of faith. And then I'm reminded in, in Acts where Paul, he's talking to King Agrippa, and he says, why do you think it's hard to believe that God raises people from the dead? Yeah. This should be like our, our everyday thing. Yeah. And I can't imagine an era of time where we need faith over fear more than ever. Yeah. COVID culture, political culture, corporate culture, cancel courts, culture, you name it. This is one of the craziest times I could ever imagine. People are literally losing their minds. But we have the hope. We need a culture of faith. Culture of faith. I don't care what the circumstances are. We need to say, I will go, I will speak, I will open my mouth, I will lay hands, I will go. Now, are you willing to be bold? Are you willing to speak up for the gospel? Even in your workplace? I... Don't have time, but I've got some stories there that have just been quite interesting. Uh, the corporate culture is just, it's, uh, it's not what it used to be, I'll tell you that much. But are we going to be passive, passive observers in culture? Or are we going to be active participants in culture to influence the kingdom? Let me just say this, you have nothing to fear because if we can get on mission... God's grace is sufficient. Okay? <clears throat> Philippians 1, 12. 
Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what's happened to me actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord, which means he's opening his mouth even when he's in chains, and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. We need a culture of faith over fear. <clears throat> I referenced uh, Billy Graham, I think we have, you know, but he understood the power of his calling. He, he understood the power of media, the radio, TV. He used a lot of those things even before it was like the thing to do. He was kind of a, a forerunner in some of that stuff. But there was this, we went to the Billy Graham Library and it was great and um, they had this video where they showed multiple clips of him on uh, late night talk shows. So some of the older folks will know, you know, Johnny Carson, uh, Larry King, David Letterman, some of those guys, um, they're like the equivalent of, you know, Jimmy Kimmel or some of these other guys today, right? But it was just amazing. They would press him. He would press them on. So you're telling me, you know, Jesus is the only way. Are you telling me that blah, blah, blah? And he would not back down in front of millions of people, faith over fear. He knew his call. Uh, and of course, we know, we know what happened with Billy Graham, but they, they estimate that over 3 million people gave their life to Jesus just because of his opening his mouth. <clears throat> so what are, you, what are you called to do? Uh, I've referenced this as well, um, the story of Moses. In, the, uh, in Exodus 3 and 4, he's, in his, he's 80 years old. He sees the burning bush. Uh, you know, God says, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Um, and then God tells Moses he's going to lead the people out of Israel. It's uh, quite a feat, quite a prophecy. Have you ever gotten a word or a prophecy that you feel is just like so ridiculous? It's just beyond you, right? You can only imagine that's how he felt. But then God asks him a very profound question. And when God asks you a question, just know it's for your benefit, not his. Um, it's probably the second most profound question he'll ever ask anyone. Uh, the first is, you know, do you know my son, Jesus? But the second one, but he asked, he asked Moses, what's in your hand? And Moses says, it's a, it's a staff, it's a stick. He says, throw it down, he throws it down, it becomes a snake. You guys know the story. Something dead becomes alive, picks it back up. And then the serpent, serpent becomes a staff again. It's a, it's a pretty profound event, and, and there's so much symbolism in terms of the staff. And there's, there's lots of stuff here, but just real quickly, it represents, the staff represents Moses' identity. It's who he was. He was a shepherd, right? You know, when, uh, with a profession, you know, like you, you have tools. So, you know, it's, if you see a stethoscope, you know, they're probably a doctor or some form of nurse or a white coat. They're like a lab technician, maybe a tool belt. They might be a construction worker. Um, you know, if they have an instrument, maybe they're a, a musician. Or if they got one of those, like, access cards that, like, expands out, you know, like, boop, you know. They might be in IT, you know. So <clears throat> anyway, it's their profession. It's their identity. But the staff also represented his income. You know, if you had a lot of cattle, you were wealthy. If you had some cattle, you're doing okay. If you had none, you're poor. But he had a staff, which means he had cattle, so he was wealthy. It was his income. Um, and it was also his influence. The staff is to guide and to point from A to B. So it was his identity, his income, and his influence. And God said, lay it down. When you lay down your identity, your income, your influence, when you lay it all down, that's when it becomes alive and God will start doing great things through you. When you take it back for yourself, it just becomes a stick. But when you lay it down for him, it becomes alive. And from that point on in the story, it's never referenced as a staff again. It's called the rod of God. And he performs the miracles. He splits the Red Sea Nile River turns the blood, strikes the, the rock, water comes out. All those miracles happen from the rod of God. 
Um, so what's in your hand? What's your stick? What's your identity? What's your influence? What's your income? What's your talents? What's your giftings? Are you willing to lay it down and say, use me? It's just a stick until you lay it down for his kingdom pur purpose. What God's gifted you in, you can use for his kingdom purpose for this gospel partnership. Again, we're not called to sit around. We're not called to just grind the nine to five, get home, eat dinner, watch TV, watch, wash, rinse, and repeat. We're not called to that. We can be called to the workplace, but it's with purpose, which I've referenced, and you should hear some of the stories from the Birches. It's, it's amazing. Um, but just some key questions to, to leave with, I think. What's God called me to do? What's, what's his urgent appeal to me? What is he, what is he appealing to me to do? What, he is, what is he inviting me to accept responsibility for? I think many of you, I think many of you know that off the top of your head. There's some things I'm still working through. Like, Lord, how does that work? How's that? But if I do, what? I'm still asking questions, and it's okay. But start thinking, what has God called me to do? What's his urgent appeal to me? What can I do right now? And don't overthink this. There's a, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid to reference this. There's a book. <clears throat> There's a book. It's in the Bible. No. It's a, again, if you're at the equip, you might know. No, no it's just, we're just joking around about referencing books, but our need to reference the Bible more. That's, that's really what it was. It was, it was funny. Um, but there is a book uh, called The 10 Second Rule, and, and the premise of it is just do the next thing you're reasonably certain Jesus wants you to do. And do it. Like, don't, don't overthink it. Just do what you reasonably think he's asking you to do and go do it. And that could be anything. Start small. Again, like small, well, it's, it's huge faith, but small faith, raising the hamster, right, might, will lead to big faith, raising the dead. But, but even this, small servant, servanthood or small things can lead into to bigger things. Just do the next thing you think he reasonably wants you to do because we can't stay still. What can I work towards? What skills and giftings do I need to grow in? What doors do I just need to start walking through? What opportunities do I need to start saying yes to? Who do I need to reach right now? Uh, in our prayer time, Andrew, on our online prayer time, he's mentioned many times, and I love it, salvations happen one person at a time. You know, yeah, you, you have the masses at times with Billy Graham, but in our our context is so many of it happens just one person at a time we begin to pray for spe people specifically but who do you need to reach out to right now who who's who has the lord put on your heart um, these questions are for you for me for all of us um, and i would just encourage you you know as you're working through this talk to the eldership team talk to your connect group leaders talk to your ministry leaders like the lord's putting this on my heart and I had this idea, and I don't know how to make it work, but together in our partnership in the gospel, we can help you or we can connect you. It's what I like to call Christian, the true Christian networking, not the one to make your ministry like famous and great, but how we work together to connect with other people that can do things to help to get the gospel out because of our partnership together in the gospel. But talk to us. Let's dream together. Let's, let's, let's help each other find uh, to connect with people, get the training needed, the, the skills needed, if, if, if needed. But let's together partner with each other and partner with him in getting the gospel out. So yeah, let's, uh, let's stand. <clears throat> yeah, go. Wonderful. Obviously, there's been a lot of response today to God. I'm going to have Tim just pray for us. Just this faith in him, and we want to just spark some things. But remember when Jonah finally said yes, an entire city that took three days to see all of it. And it says from the least to the greatest responded. Even the animals fasted because Jonah finally did what God called them to do. Friends, today is that day to say yes. 
whether it's the little things, the big things, that as we, not if we, but as we all step into what God has, the world around us forever changes. So as Tim prays for us, let your faith rise. Take these things, write them down, reach out to us. We'll pray with you, stand with you, but take action. Say yes, so that God can use us as a church to fulfill his will. Yeah. Yeah, Lord, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Lord, we just know, we know you're here. You've just seen um, just great things since the, the time we started. Uh, Lord, thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for what you're speaking to us. Thank you, Lord, that you are calling us to action. Yeah. Lord, that you are calling us to take what we now understand in terms of our partnership with you and put it into practice. Yes. Lord, that we would say yes to you, that we would uh, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And Lord, we know this is not just a thing about doing more. It's about doing what you're calling us to do, doing what you've put inside of us, God. You've put passions and desires and ideas within our heart, God, and you put them there because you want us to bring you glory because of who you've designed us to be individually. And Lord, I just, I just pray that you, that would just rise up within each one here, Lord. Maybe the, the new dreams that are coming, but Lord, maybe the dreams that have died or the flame has gone away, would you just fan into flame, God, those things that you've called us to do, the things that you're urgently appealing to, to do to get on with the business, your, your business, our Father's business, in bringing people to your Son, Jesus. And I just pray, God, that um, Lord, you would just settle that in our hearts today. Uh, Lord, would you just continue to speak to us, Lord? Give us fresh perspective, fresh ideas. Um, again, not, not because we're, we just want to do, 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 but Lord, it's just, it's because you've called us to this thing, to join you, to link arms with you. And um, I just pray for the unique uh, giftings that you've given everybody. God, would you just accentuate those? Would you help us work together um, to, to build those up? And uh, yeah, thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for what you're calling us into, what you've called us into, Lord. But may we be obedient to your call. We just say, yes, Lord, here am I. Send me. I'm ready to go. Despite the cost, faith over fear, we step into it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well done, Tim. Well done, Timmy. Guys, uh, there's coffee and things. If you want to hang for a bit, if you need prayer, please come on up. We'll see many of you tonight in the South. Have a great week. Take care.